single time I have come to present the Easter message. It has been dreaded for me. And I'm not going to lie to you. Why it's dreaded? There's a good reason why it's dreaded. You see, Dr. Scott stood for 30 years in front of you, and he would always explain the following, which should be pretty much secondhand, thirdhand news by now. But he was born into a Christian home. Mother and father were good Christians. And I'm using the word good Christians as in they, they raised their son in a Christian home. And as Dr. Scott grew up, famously in his words, he said he learned how to act like a Christian before he ever met the Lord. You ever heard that before out of his mouth? Yeah. So it took him the drive and the determination to go and get an education, for which a child of the Depression, that was a remarkable task, because especially chronicling his life, that would, that's pretty outstanding. And it was during his educational process that he fell away from the faith. He lost his faith. He would tell that every single time he would preach the resurrection message, he would tell you how he came back to the faith through a hard study of the resurrection, telling about how he was sitting in the peach cannery and he closed the last book and he said, that's it. There's no other way. He came out of that tomb, and if he came out of that tomb, I'm going to order my life exactly to that degree. He rose. End of story. Now, that was great for Dr. Scott. That was like a sponge. That was God putting his life into that man and delivering something to you that was not necessarily unique to him because many other people had, had proposed and propagated diverse theories of the resurrection. Uh, probably, we'll just put it briefly, that maybe 100 or 150 years before Dr. Scott, there were people proposing the various theories that he presented to you, but they were unique in his presentation the way he presented them to you. And every time Easter comes around, it's not Easter yet, but it will be, and I celebrate the fact that he has risen every single day. It's not a one-time event for me. Um, but I always get this perplexity because I desire to deliver to you what is authentically from my eyes, from my heart, and, of course, when we're talking about the Bible, you're not going to get radical differences, but it has to be good preaching from a person who has been given the stewardship of the pulpit and preaching the Word of God to you. It has to be that it's uniquely and authentically a part of my being as I deliver it to you. So I, I've wrestled with this, and I said, you know, I'm going to do something just a little bit different today because I knew most likely I would do this last week. I, this was in, in the mix, and I was asking the Lord to help me that I might uh, try something on you. See, you're my guinea pigs today, <laughs> and, and you're trapped, so you can't do anything about it. But um, the, the issue that, that I have is radically different from Dr. Scott. He grew up in a Christian home and fell away from the faith. I cannot really say I grew up in a Christian home. Um, and I left the church at such an early age, and I've told you only in a fantastic way did I enter the church to look at its architecture and its pomp and circumstance. It wasn't that I understood what the priest at the altar was saying even. It didn't matter. It all felt very spiritual. That was my experience. That was my faith. And different than Dr. Scott is when I did come to hear the message seemingly so late in life, it struck automatic with me. I received it like a child. Now, I've told you before, I did question a little bit about the messenger. I thought he was very unique and slightly awkward and not your typical clergy. But then, what is your typical clergy? I mean, don't look to the Catholic Church. I'm sorry, friends. That's not, not to point fingers, but what is typical? What is typical? So the message was received like a child. Now, some will say, well, that's because you were weak and you were ignorant. Well, let's just indulge me for a second. Let's just say that for 10 years I was weak and ignorant. But the last 10 years of my life, that, that would be the first 10 years with this ministry. But these last 10 years have been years of digging and studying in depth. Um, some people study to get a degree, and it's seven years. I've been going at this for 10 years, and I don't intend to stop. And the more I dig, 
the more I find there, there are less gray areas. And frankly, I never had an issue with accepting the resurrection. Now that may not be all of you. We'll probably cut the church in half and say 50% of you grew up in a Christian home or in some religious environment and then ultimately fell away and came back when you heard, when it was time and when you heard. And others will be like me. They were not raised in a Christian home searching and you probably uttered things like, I believe in God. But if you would have asked me 25 or 30 years ago when I said I believe in God, I couldn't tell you who God was or what he was like, just that he was, he existed, he was alive. That's all I could tell you and that I was basically a good person because that's what we do when we don't know any better. Um, so to, to put this very succinctly, I began to study and look at how I could attack the resurrection message, how I could present it in a way that was not so much uniquely to me because hundreds of thousands of people have picked apart the resurrection message and story. So it's not as though this is something unique, but something quite interesting that Dr. Scott said that started my study, and I, then I will go off on my own to search and take you on the journey with me, was he would teach something you used to see him do on the blackboard. He used to say, miracles cannot occur, therefore anyone who says they do, and he'd draw that big circle and take you round and round, because anybody who says that miracles occurred, they must be lying, because miracles can occur, because they don't occur. And when you begin to study the history of philosophy, you realize that that comes straight out of the pages of David Hume, who was a Scottish philosopher. And what he propagated, and this is, it's important for me because I'm the analytical type. I'll go and look at things and I want to know really what is behind that. What was the motivational force behind that? And basically, Hume's uh, proposition, essentially that, that miracles were impossible, but his conclusion was essentially that the reason why miracles are impossible, and I'm, I'm going to do this so quickly, it's impossible to reduce down somebody's ideas into two or three sentences. So it, this is just going to be to touch on something. It's almost impossible to deal with the subject in an hour, let alone what somebody has propagated and said uh, on the subject quite thoroughly. But essentially what he said was that a miracle cannot occur because essentially it violates the natural laws. So essentially anyone who says that a miracle occurred is saying that natural laws have been violated. And in Hume's, from Hume's vantage point, this was not possible. This was not at all possible because natural laws were set in place. Now, here's the problem. It depends on what your definition of is is, all right? Uh, yes. <laughs> See, Clinton did contribute to something good. Uh, it depends on what your definition of is is. Now, in Hume's, from Hume's vantage point, natural laws meant anything that occurs naturally within nature. And those natural laws could not be violated. But I began thinking about this, and he wasn't the only one. A hundred years before Hume, Spinoza propagated a similar thing, that miracles cannot occur, and he gave the theory of why they cannot occur. Very much, by the way, uh, we can say that Spinoza and Hume were, were close in that they both agreed that miracles cannot occur. But when somebody asked the question, A, which natural law was violated, and what is a natural law? No one ever stopped to think that a miracle, any miracle of in time, let's not call it history, but in time, predates any theory of natural laws. Does that make sense to you? Natural laws may have been the product of uh, scientists or at a later time, who then basically established that these are principles that are natural law. For example, dead men stay dead. Or a natural law may, may mean that a dead body decomposes. But the problem is, if your starting point is not right, your conclusions will be flawed as well. And I begin to think about this, and I begin to think that the natural law, as defined by Spinoza, as defined by Hume, does not acknowledge that there was a natural law in place before the fall of Adam. 
In other words, now, that gets into a deep subject. You're now going to refute whether or not God exists or the verity of Scripture. No, I'm not going to do that. Because if we do that, we will be here all day and all night and until next week, we ain't leaving the building. <laughs> but what I'm going to say is that if you assume that the natural law, if God created everything in his design, was that man was created to live forever and that man was not designed to die, then that is the first natural law set in place and what comes afterwards sinning man plunging the blueprint of humanity into the sinning or sinful uh, state or container we're in is actually not the design of the natural law. Now what does this have to do with the resurrection? Everything. The same people that will come against and question will also say things, for example, Thomas Paine. He said that Christianity was based on mythological and heathen uh, stories. The only problem is this. If a person takes the time to study mythology, you can know that even within mythology, where just randomly Apollo is trying to bring back his child and in the process of bringing back his dead child, he's trying to but he can't, Zeus brings a thunderbolt upon all of them. In mythology, the underworld is the underworld, and no one returns from the underworld. That's mythology. So Thomas Paine said Christianity is nothing but a heathen mythological fabrication, and it's hearsay upon hearsay, for example, that the virgin birth is hearsay upon hearsay, and that the resurrection is hearsay upon hearsay. And by the way, that in Thomas Paine's mindset, because Jesus was brought into the world in such a fantastic way, he had to exit in a more fantastic way. Now, the problem with all of this is this. There's a cemetery across the street that proves this, that we will all die. That's an absolute fact. Human existence has a terminus. The problem with a lot of these people who begin to try and stab at the possibility even trying to poke holes in it, is I think most of the time quite flawed. The starting point is wrong. And you can't make everybody believe. You can't make everybody say, well, this is true. And you can't say, well, I'm presenting evidence, like people who argue and say, well, the historical Jesus. Because then that opens the door to the debate, what is history? And my, oh my, if you could only live in the, the traffic jam of my brain, as I digested, for the sake of this, just one hour of digesting a lot of what people have ha hypothesized and presented under the guise of piercing the resurrection tapestry to like pulling on a thread that then takes everything apart. And I begin to look at these things. If you look at the Old Testament world, now we're talking about New Testament times, but the New Testament had not yet been written. What you find out is that you're either going to be dealing with Jews and the Old Testament, or outside of that, in the pagan universe, you're going to be dealing with Homer and the Iliad. That would have been, for the pagan world, that would have been the Old Testament, if you understand the comparison. And what you end up with is an impossibility, inescapable, for in Homer and the Iliad, if you read any of those um, epic stories. The underworld is a murky place where people, they have the, the portal to go into, but they never come back out. And resurrection, understood correctly, within the pagan realm did not happen. Now, there are many cultures that propagate. There is some form, whether it's transmigration of the soul or it's a, a circle of life where you ultimately come back and you are reincarnated as something else. I do not want to come back as Shirley MacLaine. Never mind. <laughs> Just saying. No, I do not believe in that. And the problem, the problem always comes back to the same thing. If we are going to pull these apart and understand, the real question at hand is why should somebody believe Jesus rose from the dead? Why should somebody believe the claims? Why should somebody even take a second look? And as I said, for me, this is difficult because all I had to do was hear Dr. Scott teach on the subject, and I knew right away, I knew I was hearing the truth. There wasn't some internal argument or 
I should say it this way, the only thing that I had to settle was whether the things that I deemed spiritual in my previous experiences were indeed spiritual at all versus the true spirituality I was experiencing, which was not the floating and the rafters and the candles and the wind and people falling over, but falling deeper and deeper in love with God's word and, and wanting to know and wanting to probe. So I think the, the issue for me to present this is to ask, why would somebody listening to me want to believe in the resurrection? And how would somebody approach this subject just on a lay level? Because we could, we could start with complexities. I, we could define what a miracle is. We could define what a resurrection is. Let's, let's just do that briefly. A miracle, if you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, will give you something to the effect of something that occurs outside of nature, usually by divine uh, power, usually attributed to God. And a resurrection, do not be confused, as a lot of people are. I've had people ask me about this because they know that I study a lot of Egyptology. What fascinates me with the Egyptians is their fascination with the afterlife, but they never once propagated that they would return in the body that they wore, even though they were very much into preserving the body, mummification, etc. They were more concerned with their journey into the afterlife than the concept of returning to the now. So if you think about it, why should somebody stop and examine and look? Well, there's, there's good reason. This is why I said it's difficult for me. I received this and it was like lights went on and that's that. But for somebody who doesn't get it and who doesn't understand, the reason for probing and looking is very simple. You're going to find that once you begin to examine the facts as they are, you are going to be forced with something that you are going to have to deal with. Now, in Dr. Scott's presentation, he went through great labor to tell you about different theories and propagated different ideas, but ultimately he gestalted it down to one of two things. They were either, disciples were either telling a lie or they were telling the truth. And then the question begs, would you keep propagating a lie if you knew you were going to die? Would you keep propagating a lie if... So at some point, perhaps in a part B or C of this message, we will go and look at the disciples themselves. But I decided the only person I want to talk about today is the Apostle Paul. And the reason why I want to talk about the Apostle Paul is because he's outside of the pale. If we, a person just approaching this who's going to have more of a negative approach to the resurrection and is more skeptical might say, okay, look, I, I know the story that Jesus said he was going to die and, and then he died and then he said he was going to raise up from, from out of the grave and he did and he appeared to the disciples, and then he ascended, and then he said, by the way, I'm coming back, but it's just not real to me. And it, this cannot be, um, for any person listening, this cannot be something that you just subjectively say, but I know this is true. It must be articulated. It must be understood in an intelligent way that if you were to leave here today and somebody were to ask you, why do you believe this thing? A naysayer comes to you and says, why do you spend your time trying to know about God, this is a waste of time and a waste of your life because A, either God doesn't exist or if he exists, he sure didn't come in the form of a man and he sure didn't come in the form of a man to write which was that which was wrong, the broken communion and fellowship that Adam once had and enjoyed to restore us to that proper communion, to restore us to the possibility of spending eternity with God. All of that... Somebody might say, I can dispel. The problem is that Christianity does start with a miracle, and it doesn't start necessarily. If you want to start pulling on the thread that essentially is going to unravel everything, it doesn't really start with Jesus in the New Testament saying, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to be raised up again, and you're going to see me, and then I'm going to ascend, and I'll come back. You've got to basically go into the, New, into the Old Testament, and you've got to examine all of the scriptures and prophecies that are pointing to him, including the third chapter of Genesis, right there in the opening of the Old Testament, which tells you essentially God saw the fall of man and the need for him to be rescued. Now, I'm not proposing that all of this can be solved in an hour. It can't. I sure want to. I'd sure like to run through this and say, hey, I'm going to bring you on my journey. We're going to get this done in an hour. But I don't think it can be done in an hour. 
as I began to analyze and make some criteria for assessing the verity of something, which again, my assessments, my, my cubby holes may be slightly flawed because I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on what I already know. It's hard for me to approach the subject as someone who says it didn't happen and it can't happen because I've settled it. Now, there may be people listening to me who say, well, I'm, I, I believe it happened, but, and this is the disconnect. You, forgive me for going backwards for a minute. The disconnect is when people say, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Then you must also grapple with the fact that the same power that raised up Christ from the dead shall so dwell in you. And that means we're not impotent orphans left to fend for ourselves, but he's given us a way initially to have communion and fellowship and preparing us in the now to spend eternity with him. Now, these are contrary teachings to common Christianity, as I call it, because common Christianity says, live your best life now. But if you truly understand what I'm telling you, you realize how skewed that is. Not that there's any error in living your best life now, but if all you're living is your best life now for the now, and you're not living for Christ, and understanding this is preparation to be with him, all of this, all of your experiences, all of your, all the, all of your mess-ups, all, that's what I said yesterday when I was praying. I said, you mean all of my mess-ups and all of my, oh boy, how did I let that happen? All of that was all preparation. It's all preparation to bring me to a better, clear understanding? Well, pretty much. Although God didn't speak to me, but I can tell you that's pretty much the way it works. So quite radical that people would say, well, if you believe this, shouldn't there be something that changes in a person? And the answer is yes. That change happens over time. I don't know, some people will tell you, when I was saved, I know the day and the hour and the second, and, and, the, and there were witnesses there, and well, good for you. That didn't happen for me like that. In fact, I heard the message, I knew that Dr. Scott was teaching the truth, but I still, the thing I grappled with inside is, shouldn't there be something happen? You ever had that? Shouldn't there be something going on? I mean, I still feel like the same ball of crud that I was when I heard the first time and the second time. And the th Shouldn't there be like a change or something? You go to the mirror and you still look the same. And then, but again, over time and imperceptible that these changes begin to occur. Now, there are exceptions to every rule. I really believe that. You might say somebody who read the Gospels decided miracles cannot occur, accepted all of the Gospels, but miracles cannot occur. Do you know who that was? Thomas Jefferson. He decided that he would make his own Bible. So basically, he removed all the miracles. It's called the Jefferson Bible. It was made after his death. And basically, the way that Bible ends is they rolled the stone in front of the tomb and all the disciples went their way, period. Wow, that's a great end to Christianity. Well, you might as well stay in Judaism if that's the end because Judaism ends with Malachi pronouncing a curse. You might as well have a curse than to have something baited in front of you that just ends like this. And they rolled the stone away and they all went home. So I'm not proposing to remove miracles, but I am proposing that we subject certain things to a test to see if they meet a metal test criteria. So let's see if we can do this. And as I said, you're my guinea pigs today. You don't have a choice. So if we were subjecting uh, miracles and miracle claims, we would put them into, we would subject them to four categories. Now, this is not exhaustive. I don't want you to think that I've exhausted the subject. It's just that we've got to do this in an hour. And I've got, and this is not the message, oh boy. So. They've got to fit into four categories, and the four categories are as follows. Deductive argument or analysis, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, criteriological analysis or argument. Explanatory and probabilistic. So those are the four categories I'm going to deal with. So deductive, it seems axiomatic. A deductive argument would be the, fo the following. All miracles are attested to by people who were eyewitnesses to them, and those eyewitnesses suffered at great length for what they say they saw, 
and at peril, risk of life, and including the fact that they died as martyrs or whatnot, which seems to be the central theme of Christianity. Um, these witnesses and their accounts, therefore, by deduction, by virtue of deduction, seem to be plausible, and therefore, this must be a true statement. Now, I said this is not exhaustive, so, and it is slightly one-sided, but you can pull these apart all you want. We're going to make an application with these criteria after I'm done explaining them. Criteriological argument or analysis, and I'll read it so I stay close to uh, Charles Leslie was the one that propounded that a miracle should meet four criteria. That it be done so that men's outward senses, eyes and ears may judge the matter. That it may be done, may be done publicly where all can see. And that public monuments to the fact or the act or outward actions or deeds be performed because of this. So in Leslie's argument, essentially the resurrection would hold to one and two, uh, that men's eyes or ears saw and therefore judged the matter, and number two, that it was done publicly where all can see. Somebody will come in and say, no, no, wait a minute. That's not necessarily true if you consider what Paul describes later on. He, Jesus revealed himself to only certain people, but if you go back to his death, this is why the brilliance of the chronicling of the writers, his death was done publicly, was publicly known. He was seen crucified. He was seen, we have these other people introduced, such as Pilate and so forth, a Nicodemus and uh, Joseph of Arimathea coming to beg for the body. So this was well known. It meets one and two meet the criteria, for example. And then lastly, we might say, what act is commemorated? Well, we transferred the Sabbath to the Lord's Day, commemorating, supposedly commemorating the Lord, and things like the institution of the last Supper, which becomes the table of the Lord, celebrated supposedly by everyone. So that's criteriological. We're going to apply these in a minute. Explanatory, which is really self-evident. Jesus died by crucifixion. His followers professed to have experiences after his death where they believed they literally saw the risen Christ. The followers of Christ were transformed, and their personalities were transformed. Their understanding was transformed, and they were willing to die for what they said they saw. So if you want to try and pierce through this, it's an explanation. You'd have to try and explain away, and that always requires when people are going to go trying to tear this apart, they'll say, but we don't have any eyewitnesses, which brings us back to the argument of the verity of the writings, which I'm not going to try and defend today. We're just going to assume certain facts because my intent is not to apply it to the Gospels themselves, but to Paul and to his testimony and to his writing. And lastly, probabilistic. So this is maybe a little bit more complex. Um, a set of factors or facts rendering the conclusion more probable. So. Basically, what that would be, there is actually a, a, a theory that was proposed, Bayer, so if you want to look that up, Bayer's theorem, that basically would be uh, what is probabilistic miracles and evidence and weighing out in the matter versus somebody claiming something but not having evidence. And they begin to weigh this out to realize that there's more probability in someone testifying to something that happened considering, and they start to weigh out all the factors behind that person's testimony. So who better a character to test this on than Paul? Works perfectly for me. So let's see if this works at all. Turn in your Bibles to Acts 9. We're going to see if we can make an application to this. And, and by the way, while you're turning there, um, it's, it is interesting that if you were to try and pick one facet to explain to somebody, to give them some concrete, solid, this is why I believe. It may not just be Paul. It may not just be the disciples. It may not just be the women. It may not just be, there's so many criteria we could scrutinize. But I'm starting with Paul because as I said, he's outside the pale. Now listen, I believe this. I believe that the disciples loved Jesus so much that if we were to even entertain the fact 
that Jesus died, and they put him in a tomb, and he didn't raise up from the dead. And all of these guys said, let's make a pact. We'll say that he rose up from the dead. We'll propagate this. We'll go around telling everybody that he is risen. We saw him ascend. He said he's coming back. Let's just say that they're just a bunch of liars. Just entertain me. And we, we just say, we're going to just push these guys out of here. We're not even going to take what they've said because they love their leader. I know what that's like to love somebody so much that you'll, what I've termed as shemming them. You'll cover and protect them. You want to look out for their best interest. So that's why Paul makes this all the more riveting and fascinating. So in Acts 9, we, have, we encounter Paul, Saul, and this is what I want us to see because it's so familiar. There's the possibility in everything with our familiarity we engage in what I call fictitious Bible reading. All of us have done it. All of us. I challenge you, just as a footnote to show you how fantastic our reading abilities are, I challenge you to read the accounts here in Acts 9 and elsewhere where Paul gives his testimony, and I challenge you to find that it says he fell from a horse or from a donkey. I don't even read one hoof anywhere. But yet, if you were to walk into the church of Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome, or if you were to walk into Michelangelo's Pauline, uh, you would see artworks that are stupendous. I mean, Caravaggio's depiction of the Apostle Paul, he's on the ground, and all you see is the horse's rump, and you see the hoof, and by the way, it's shod with nice metal shoes. And Paul is dressed in slightly a little bit like Roman garb, which could be, it's possible, because he was a Roman. But you read the background to that painting, and you realize that that painting was submitted by Caravaggio and refused. And the religious folks that commissioned that painting said, why did you have to put the horses behind in the picture? Michelangelo's is even more stupendous. The heavens are opened, and you see angels and what looks like God reaching down, and here's Paul on the ground, and the horse is charging away. But I challenge you to read. Uh, I don't read an account. Even I've done that. Even I said if I was knocked from my horse or an animal. But I don't read of any of that. It just fell to the ground. So that's why I said we have to be careful about how we read things. Uh, I pointed out to you in my Christmas message, St. Francis of Assisi is attributed to the creche, to the cradle scene, where from that point in history forward, oxes and asses and camels are present in every nativity scene, but they're not present in the Bible. So that's why I said let's read cautiously and carefully. Not that it alters our faith whatsoever, but I do want to point out something. I have met people who have gauged their faith on movies, biblical movies. Yeah? You used to know somebody who would say, oh, yeah, you got to go see that movie. That was a great movie. And, you know, it's, it's tantamount to this. You know, Cecil B. DeMille, Ten Commandments. Don't you love that movie? I mean, it was a great feat for its time, but it's slightly cheesy now when you look at it. I mean, 20 years ago, it was like, wow. 30 years ago, wow, right? But, but if you watch it today in comparison to the high-tech standards and everything, it's still, it's still amazing. But knowing the Bible, there's even things there that are just flat-out wrong. Uh, the movie that was just released uh, recently, Exodus. Oh, boy, did, I mean, at least some of those critics, at least some, you can tell they're not all heathen because some just skewed that movie and said, well, it's a great story, but it's sure not the Bible. So we have to be careful. There are some people who would make their faith revolve around paintings, artwork, or movies. Oh, boy. Lord, we need your help. Here we go. Acts 9, and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord we went unto the high priest. I'm reading this because we're, gonna, we're going to stick these into these four categories, what we see here, to see if they meet the metal test. And by the way, as I said, it's not exhaustive. This is just a preliminary four pigeonholes to just deal with. And we could experiment again next week and see if we can come up with somewhere else and we might look for more piercing and pulling apart. But here we go. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, 
that if he found any of this way, that being the Christians, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Now, have any of you had that experience? Oh, I'm glad I have no mouth. <laughs> Neither have I. In fact, my experience has been mostly, truly thou art a God who hidest thyself. Now, there was good reason for this. A light shines around about him from heaven. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, the, the first thing is, if this is a fabrication, this is a fanciful fabrication. And even more than that, it becomes worse. If it's a fabrication, it becomes a complicated fabrication. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. This is fantastic. The men which journey with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. They heard the voice. Now, if this is, this is what people have done to dissect this, saying that this was either an objective or a subjective experience. Objective, real time happening in the public domain versus subjective, Internal, an internal experience. Well, let me just say one thing. If it's an internal experience, it's quite weird that these men heard. <laughs> Paul's a great ventriloquist then. They heard, but they saw no man. Even more crazy is, remember, he's on a mission to destroy Christians. And the Lord speaks to him, supposedly, and tells him to go into the city and you'll be told what you have to do. Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand, brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise. This is what's so fabulous, as if this was just Paul let me backtrack for a minute. If this was just Luke telling a tale about Paul, now we're getting into weaving some other stuff because you're, you're dealing now with Ananias, who's a guy who Paul doesn't know, who's going to be told by the Lord. Ananias will be told by the Lord to go and seek out this man and lay hands on him for him to gain his sight again. <laughs> so if you're making this up, you're really making this complicated. But Ananias says, I'm here, and he, the Lord says to him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight. Inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias. This is the freaky part. So the Lord is telling Ananias that, he's, that Paul, Saul, is seeing Ananias in a vision, and that Ananias will be sent to him. So if you're making this up, you're making this even sound more convoluted. And he says... Tall, Saul of Tarsus, behold, he prayeth. He's seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him that he might receive sight. And then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard many, by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must prosper for my name's sake. <laughs> okay, I'll read what it really says. He must suffer for my name's sake. See, that's why I said I don't, I just throw that in because I want to make sure you're reading along with me. Some of you write down, oh yeah, that's the real, that's what the Greek says. <laughs> But what's so convoluted about this is Ananias went his way, entered into the house. So where, where the Lord said he'd find this man, he found this man, Saul, entered into the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me 
that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as, as it had been scales. And he received sight, forthwith arose and was baptized. And when he'd received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And in verse 20, you read, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Now, why I want to take a look at this closely is this. Paul had nothing to do with Matthew, and he had nothing to do with Mark, and he had nothing to do with Peter, and he had nothing to do with Thomas, and he had nothing to do with James, and he had nothing to do... And you keep going down the list. This is a man, as he calls himself, one born out of due time, out of nowhere. This happens to him. And as, as I said, we're going to pierce this in a minute. We're going to see if we, can, if we can make our pigeonholes apply. What is so radical is that he doesn't just recount this event here. He will recount it in Acts, Luke will, two more times. They're not quite the same, and I'll elaborate that perhaps in another message of why they're not quite the same. It makes perfect sense in context. But Paul will not change his story as he goes. And it will go from this, we just saw some key words. They're not as visible in English as they are in the Greek. So before we subject our criteria, let me just make a few notes here. One of those uh, categories, I believe it may be the first or the second, uh, will be the second, which is the criteriological category, that it is done so that men's outward senses, eyes and ears, may judge the matter. And what is extremely important for us to consider, if you're going to look at this, you've got to look at this the right way. We know the Bible was not written in English. We know that this portion of the Bible and forward is written in the Greek language. And here goes the dilemma. In the Greek, you've got one word for to listen or to hear, akoue, and its derivatives. Hupakoue, obedience, but they're all related to one word. To feel or to touch, you only have one word in the Greek, but to see, to behold, to see, you've got a plethora of words that fall into diverse categories. That's how precise the Greek is. So when we read about, for example, the senses, remember, in my category, criteriological number two, that men, men, men's outward senses, eyes and ears, may judge the matter. It's crucial that we define and make sure we're dealing with the right words. For example, in the Greek, a very common word, very commonly used, for um, something being seen, idu, behold, idu. Um, then there are other words like blepo. We get our, our, the doctors will use the word for eyelid or something pertaining to the eye in the English as blepha, blepo in the Greek. There's another word, theo, theomai, theomai, which is from that spectacle word that I said out of Matthew 6. There is another word that is skopio, to scope out. Doesn't necessarily translate to that definition in the Greek, but there's many different words. So we're absolutely clear that when we're looking for the words for actual sight, that we're using, the, we're seeing the right Greek words that pertain to sight. Because elsewhere in Paul's writing, he's going to say, and as I go on to visions and revelations, those may be subjective. But certain words being used in the Greek are objective and clear. They pertain to sight, real eyesight, seeing, beholding, to gaze, to look upon, and not an inner subjective experience. Now, I had to clarify that because not only will it happen here in Acts, it will also happen in Galatians and in 1 Corinthians. And those are the passages we will ultimately look at. I'm, I'm going to do this however long it takes us, we're going, to get, we're going to get through this. So, the first criteria, if we were just taking Acts 9, the first criteria, we might apply deductive analysis. And in that criteria, the definition of that deductive analysis, all miracles that are attested to by people claiming to have witnessed them, undergo hardships, including peril of life, or extreme loss in consequence to what they have claimed uh, is true, are worthy to be credited as true. And as I said, this is not exhaustive. It's just one of four pigeonholes that we're looking at. And there's, you can make as many as you want. I'm using these. Therefore, if Paul 
applies into this category, we will count him as a worthy witness. So here's a man who had nothing, no part in the way and in the cover-up and in the conspiracy that Jesus died and rose again, if we deem that it's not true and it's all a lie. He had no part in the conspiracy. Now here he is, and his first message after this, we'll call it the Damascus Road experience, his first message, he goes into the synagogue, into the temple to preach Jesus is the Son of God. Now, not Jesus is Lord like the people do on TV, that God sent his only begotten Son and that this indeed is the Messiah we've all been waiting for. This is him. And he begins to unfold the revelation of Jesus Christ to these people. That's quite radical. So now, it's not only that he has believed a miracle, seen a miracle. He, we know he heard the risen Christ. And if you take verses 17 and 27 of Acts 9, the words being used for what he saw, these are not subjective. Now, from, from Ananias' perspective, he says that he... Paul, Saul, had seen the Lord. And then onward in verse 27, which I did not read, in verse 27 talks about how Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. And we're talking about real perception, not subjective. Be, there will be words elsewhere that we'll know are internal, subjective. So can we put this to the test in the deductive pigeonhole? And the answer is yes. What about in the criteriological pigeonhole? And the answer is that it may be done so that men's eyes and ears may judge. Well, here we have Paul hearing, we have the men hearing, we have him losing his sight, and then we also have him regaining his sight. All of these are miracle events, but as pertaining to the resurrected Lord, the ears were all subjected. That meets that criteria. It must be done publicly. You don't get any more public than the pathway that Paul was on. It was done publicly. And then, of course, the third portion of that criteriological category is that monuments to the act or outward actions or deeds performed because of it. He goes straightway into the temple after he regains his sight to preach, Jesus is the Son of God. So that's number two. In the explanatory argument, we might by virtue of the definition. Jesus died by crucifixion. His followers professed to have experiences after his death where they believed to literally see the risen Christ. The, fo the followers of Christ were transformed. Paul meets all of these criteria. If not revealed here in Acts 9, in 1 Corinthians 15, he will say he saw the Lord just as the Lord appeared to Peter, just as the Lord appeared to all of the disciples and then all of the apostles and then about 500 at one time and then to him. Physical eyesight meets the criteria. By the way, was Paul's personality changed? Yes, he went from persecutor of the church to pro proclaimer, uh, heralder of the risen Lord. Um, how about probabilistic? And that seems to be kind of a little bit shaky in its pigeonhole. Probabilistic is that will come to line up all the facts and they will lead us to a more probable conclusion that, well, in this case, I don't think you could get more probable. It was well known by the mouth of Ananias that this man, Saul of Tars Tarsus, prosecuted, he persecuted the church. He tormented the, the believers. You can't get any more clear that the probability of this being a lie and being fabricated as to the authenticity of his, Paul's conversion, hearing, and his reaction, going in and straightway preaching exactly what he was firing and breathing out threatenings against, fits into the probabilistic category of more than likely, this is a true statement. These are true statements being told. Now, I told you I'm only looking at Paul. So turn with me, if you will, to Galatians. As I said, it's impossible to do this, for, in, in my vantage point, it's impossible to do this, to accomplish this in one hour because of the amount of information we could look at. So just in, in kind of brushing the surface today, I'm giving you my perspective. If someone was going to throw out all of the accounts of all of the miracles, 
of all of the eyewitness testimonies. I mean, what's so miraculous is that people will say, well, the resurrection couldn't have happened. And my question is, well, what about all the people who were blind and received their sight? What about the mass multitudes that from just a little bit of bread and fish were fed? What about the money coming out of the fish's mouth? What about water being changed to wine? What about calling Lazarus from the dead? What about all these things? So were all of these people delusional? Because if you believe all the other things, the resurrection's kind of like a drop in the bucket, you know. Guy who's got a withered hand and suddenly he's touched and whoo, hand is like normal. Too bl blind from birth, uh, lepers, you name it. So that's why I said sometimes people will say, well, I don't believe the disciples and all of their writing, all of their accounts. The funny thing is when you begin to analyze, and we will, we'll take on in another message, I will take on the verity of the text themselves to, to try and look at the text themselves. And you come up with some very interesting deductions just on the text themselves, including Luke as an anomaly because he was not part of the initial followers. He just set out to set everything in order. Luke in Acts is the bulk of Acts, and Luke pertained to his writing or belonged to his writing. And you find out that if he was going around asking questions, it seems like he talked to many people. How did he know, for example, in the opening of Luke's Gospel when it says that this thing that Mary heard, she was pricked in her heart when she heard about the child Christ? How did, how did he know that? Except he must have gone, he said, okay, let's sit down, I want you to tell me everything that happened here. I'm gonna write it down, I'm gonna set it in order. So you cannot, as I'm doing right now, I'm doing it deliberately, you cannot throw out all of those other uh, Chronicles, but right now we are. We're just looking at Paul because he's the oddball. Now we're in Galatians, and Galatians 1 through to perhaps, well, it's pretty much the whole first chapter. It's somewhat interesting to me because it carries with it some very interesting information if you are looking to understand how Paul perceives and really the sight. So, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who he raised from the dead. Boy, if this is a fraud, his first speech, his first letter to the Galatians is to tell them he's sent by God, he's called by God, this one that was raised from the dead. I mean, you know, if you're going to go for it, go for it, man, because this is like, it's just covered in stuff here, or else it's true. That's why I said I sifted down what Dr. Scott said, and you really come up with it's either a lie or it's true. And if it's a lie, then we ought to just let this go because it's, boy, challenging enough. But if it's true, wow. And all the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia. And he gives the greeting, and he says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another. But there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. And now read with me. He says, he wants to make sure that uh, people understand he wasn't schooled by the other apostles or disciples. He received all that he knew. Remember, Paul studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a Pharisaical tribe of Benjamin, well-studied, well-versed in Judaism, steeped in Judaism. But the revelation and the things that he's proclaiming now, he didn't receive it from any man. He says right here in verse uh, 11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, neither, for I neither received it of man, neither was taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ, by the apocalyptio, that is the unveiling or the revealing of Christ. For you have heard of my, my behavior in time past in the Jews' religion. He's just reiterating in a microcosm what we just read in Acts 9. You've heard of my behavior in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. 
and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He's going to just keep repeating the same story over and over again. Now, if it's a lie at some point, you're going to flub up and you're not going to be telling your lie the same way. But he keeps telling it the same way over and over again. And as I said in the book of Acts, his three accounts will change for good reason. Typically, in whose presence he was in, the story changed somewhat for the people in, who, in whose presence he was in. But here, he's recounting this. And then he says something amazing. It says, he says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, there's another reveal, another apokalufthai, that is to reveal his son in me, which could be translated reveal his son in me and through me. The revelation of Christ in me to give me understanding and knowledge and through me to you. This is radical. Now, can you take the same test and the same pigeonholes over and over again? The answer is yes, because he's doing the same thing and he's telling the same thing. Then he says, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia, returned again unto Damascus. And after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. So this time has elapsed before he sees Peter and abode with him 15 days. But of the other apostles, Sia, none save James, save James, the Lord's brother. And then he says, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. So what's so interesting to me is that Paul is concerned with telling people that he saw, he was not, he didn't receive this of men, he saw, which would fit into our pigeonhole of either hearing or seeing. And you can go back through the pigeonholes all over again in Galatians and come up with, well, this is either the best lie ever told or it's gotta be true. How could somebody change so radically? Now, I've told you this many times. I travel into institutions, and I've seen people. Well, I once met a man who's now the head, by the way, of the Assemblies of God. Uh, he's not the head of the Assemblies of God, but in, in a high-ranking position, who was an inmate at Solano. You know what I'm talking about? Um, and he wrote a book about his conversion. He was converted in, in prison. Uh, can't think of the gentleman's name, but had a profound experience, not, not an Apostle Paul type experience, but had an experience doing hard time for a hard crime. God converted, came out, and he's not one of these people that just got converted to you know, get out on good behavior, uh, is, is in a high-ranking position in the Assemblies of God. I've, I meet many of these people. How do you explain that? How, how do you explain somebody's radical behavior change, outlook? Yeah, but I, but I'm, I'm only just as you are. You, you, you have the opportunity to see me and have seen me for almost 20 years change in front of your eyes. I don't have the opportunity to know you as you've known me in this case. You hear me all the time. You can see things have changed and things have changed and evolved and are yet changing. But how is this possible? Again, it comes back to it must be something that God's doing because I sure wasn't going to change anything. Not like this. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, all right. If you take all of this out of Galatians and subject it to the same test, will they, will they work? And the answer is yes, and you can do it on your own because I'm running out of time. So I want to take you to the last place in this message, which is 1 Corinthians 15. And I guess the thing here is this. The most important thing that can be said is... I like what J.B. Phillips says, this chapter is perhaps the most important chapter on the subject of the resurrection apart from the Gospels. And I like that he said that because there's something that was going on at Corinth. So don't be too harsh on Paul. He comes and he's going to establish churches at Galatia and they're they're not only doubting his apostleship, and everywhere he goes is the same thing. In Corinth, they were doubting his apostleship. They were also doubting that the resurrection actually happened because some said it already happened, some said it's not going to happen. And you read that here where he addresses in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says in verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, 
how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Because that's what people were going around at Corinth saying. Not outside of the church. This was happening in the church. That's what's so staggering. Now, here's the little pierce hole right here. Somebody's going around and saying it didn't happen and it can't happen because these things don't ever happen. And they're never going to happen. And here's a guy who, if this was all a lie, could have said, hey, psh, but don't tell anybody. Just shut up. But he includes it in his writing, which makes it all the more crazy. I mean, you've got to be nuts to introduce a, even a fragment of doubt, but this is the doubt that was circulating at Corinth. Now, this last one is probably the most key. You'll find, if you go to funerals, you'll hear this scripture read most of the time. I feel sorry for people who read this at funerals because this should be read every single day of your life until it becomes second nature and you realize that he indeed, he indeed did raise from the dead and don't wait until somebody's dead to tell people about this incredible subject, which is life-changing. It should change your whole outlook, your understanding, your, your perception of everything around you. As I said, if, if it's true and if it is true, then we better take a second look at what happens to people when they have been touched. I'm not talking about their certain martyrdom or their certain doom or their suffering, but I am talking about changed personalities, changed vision, changed perspective. So here, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. He's talking about their salvation, by which also ye are saved. Here's their standing. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. Do you hear him telling, live your best life now? Do you hear him telling how it's going to be great and you're going to be blessed and you're awesome and you're amazing and thank you for your offering? <laughs> For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and he was seen. And here are the key words here. He was seen. These are the words we get, our word for ophthalmology, optical. This is real vision. This is not visions. And he, he says elsewhere in his writing, I'll go on to revelations and visions. That's later. But right here he says, seen. He was seen of Cephas, that is Peter. And then of the twelve. I stopped there for a minute because I have a hypothesis on that. He was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. Well, let's just be sure of one thing. In the book of Acts, they had to cast lots for a replacement for Judas, yes? And we know that Christ appeared one time while Thomas was absent. He actually appeared a couple of times, came through a locked door and Thomas wasn't there, right? But at some point, it says he appeared to the twelve. And we know he appeared to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. So I just counted Mary as part of the twelve. That's, that's the first book of Scott right there. Because there, there wasn't twelve initially. There was one missing, and that, that casting of lots happened later on down the road. Doesn't matter. I and mean, when you start to think about it, Paul didn't include the women for good reason. Women were not to be included as they were not to be counted as uh, valid eyewitnesses, they, their sole responsibility was to produce children, and yet Jesus Christ lets women, if you read in Luke's gospel, sustain his ministry. It was the women that brought money and food, for the most part. Huh. Okay, so me thinks me read what it says. <laughs> and he was seen of Cephas, Peter, and then of the twelve. So, seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. That's to say, hey, listen, you know, some of these people are here. The greater part remain, but some are falling asleep. Hey, if you want to go and do a, uh, an interview and ask some of the people, you might find some here that were here. We might do that right here and say, well, there might be some of you that were here. Out of the 500 brethren that remain, that's basically why that's put in there. Not, you know, like, not like see, but see, if you want to go query for yourself, there's some that are still alive. After that, he was seen of James. There's another anomaly right there. Here's a guy who, while his brother was alive, while Jesus is walking the face of the earth, James is not following Jesus. And as far as we're concerned, 
he, James, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, sought to put Jesus away, thought he was cuckoo. After that, he was seen to James. And then James goes on to head up the church at Jerusalem. Like, what happened there? I, just, I thought I'd be the boss of a big lie. <laughs> Never mind. And then of all the apostles, we don't know how many that all is, but of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me. All of these words for seen are the same thing. The optomai, with the eyes, not in visions, not subjective, but objective, real visions. That what? If we take them back to our pigeonholes, meet the deductive criteria, the criteriological criteria, the explanatory and the probabilistic criteria, because now you've got so many people to deal with who had a real visual, in Paul's case he had both audio and visual, and the disciples' case, the same thing. So you're subjected to these tests and you realize that at the end you come up with, can I, can I rip this apart? Is this doable? But Paul has no reason to lie. We might say, let's kick out Peter and let's kick out the 12 and let's, who, who even knows about who these 500 brethren are, but let's include them because we don't even know who they are, they're nameless. And James, who is the least likely, let's kick him out too because he's family. And we're left with something staggering though. You can't escape it, which is these people all saw. They had a real experience and then they began immediately, radically changed to go out and preach and tell people about this Jesus whom God raised up, who is indeed the Son of God, who came in the flesh. And now mission begins to become clear. Forget about arguing Thomas Paine and arguing Hume and arguing these other people. We could live in a bubble in ignorance and say, well, a miracle can occur because miracles don't occur, because it's a, it's a violation of the natural laws. But what if the one who created the natural laws decided to enter in and not violate, but simply change what man had violated in its natural laws as they were intended to be? And you walk away with, it could only take a miracle. It, a miracle needed to happen to fix this. Now, as I step back from all this, the thing that I, I kind of walk away with, just on today's message alone. I haven't even touched the disciples. I haven't touched the verity. We haven't even touched prophecy. We haven't touched anything like that. Just Paul subjecting him to these tests. There'll be others. But the reality is that the, this is either a fantastic lie, fabricated, and the thing is, Paul has no, there is no motive. There is no motivation. There is no rhyme or reason. There is nothing that makes sense in him propagating this lie except he's telling the truth. He saw what he saw, a changed life, and the incredible thing. He turns around and begins to tell other people, this same power that raised up Christ from the dead shall dwell in you, that you're no longer damned, that you have hope in this anchor, who, yes, he ascended and has sat down at the right hand of the Father on high, and he in Hebrews, ever liveth to make intercession for us. He is a living, risen Savior, a real presence in our lives. And this is the thing that I think uh, jars me. I didn't have to pick apart. I heard and I, I realized this is a true thing. This is not something fabricated. And I turn around and I wonder, how come so many people just go through the Christian walk and they're not grabbing hold of something which on, in its face value is impossible? could probably never be replicated again, but done and entered into the flow of time to let humankind know that God didn't leave us, as I said, orphans and abandoned, but gave us a way. Not just, oh, well, when we die, we'll be with him. Preparation in the now, giving us his spirit, giving us a dimension of his being in us that, no, I cannot change this vile container, but he's changing me. And just like these that were changed, you are being changed. So when people say to me, well, why should I pay attention to the resurrection? Why does it make a difference? Well, I'll give you just one piece of information that is, for me, something that's quite revelatory. Because I haven't even addressed the resurrection. I've only addressed Paul and his events. We haven't even touched the resurrection. Oh, mystery, time's up. <laughs> while people are concerned about the empty tomb and the wrong tomb, while people are concerned about theories, whether the body was stolen or whether it was a hallucination or a resuscitation, there's one thing that no one can escape. The fact that there was no body in the tomb, and scholars have debated over this, you'll find a great, if you go to study the subject, you'll find a great divided chasm on this. 
whether Jesus was resurrected, great controversy in the church, whether he was resurrected in the earthly body that he wore as a real body, or whether he was resurrected in a spiritual way. Now, when you read the scriptures, you know he was resurrected in a real body because that real body presented to Thomas, the doubting one, who wanted to put his fingers in the nail. He'd only believe then was God's little footprint to say, hey, there's going to be some that are going to doubt, and this one I'll give him, as he's always been with me, as he followed me, a doubter. I'm going to give him the ability to see and to touch for himself. Now, we don't live in these times like those of the New Testament. We live in a time where the revelation is given to us to open up his word and to understand if this is a true statement, if this is a true story, that Christ rose up from the dead, that body that he, ra that he was raised in, is probably one of the most important pieces of evidence against all other claims and against all other theories. Why? Because if he only rose in a spirit form, we could say there is no hope for us. But he did exactly what he said he would do, raised up in that body, and then he tells Mary, he says, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended. These little footnotes inside that tell me, as I said, we haven't even touched the resurrection. We've just pulled apart Paul and his miracle event and conversion say that there is something yet today that God is still doing because the scripture declares he has not changed. The same yesterday, today, and forever. That tells me, for you who are listening, there is definitely hope for all who come and who will hear. There's hope for people who think they're so religious and they're so caught in their ways that they can't, as Paul was religious and caught in his ways. But when God calls... He will call you, and it may not be a uh, lightning bolt, it may not be a shining light, but at some point the heart will be opened up to receive, and you will be changed, and you will be changed by the resurrected Christ. Now, I'm going to believe that maybe next week I can pick up and actually talk about the resurrection, which I didn't get to today, but at least you'll know the starting point. That's at the core of my faith. That should be at the core of every single believer's faith, that Christ rose up from the dead, and if that, is, if that is settled, if that matter is settled, based on investigation, you think God's going to be upset because you open up the book and you begin to probe? No, just like Thomas. He gives us the opportunity to probe and to open up and to look and to discover for ourselves, and at some point, he will do this. You will do what Dr. Scott did. You will indeed do what I have done, which is close the book and say, I know that he rose. Just from this book alone, he rose from the dead. And that gives me all the hope I need that it, in the midst of anything I'm going through, I have a risen, resurrected Savior by my side and to lead me and guide me until I stand in his presence. That's the message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call one 800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.